Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome to the CEC Edisit Live Lecture. Dear friends, we are pleased to announce that we have started a new series on molecular biology and yesterday we conducted first lecture in this series. Today is the second lecture in the series and dear friends as you know that in our previous session we discussed about DNA we try to understand about what DNA is dear friends as I said we would be taking the series forward and in this second lecture today we are going to understand about central dogma genetic code and RNA and for this we have again with us in our studios Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat is assistant professor in the department of zoology Ramjus College, University of Delhi. So, dear friends, let's take advantages from her experiences and let's try to understand more about molecular biology. That is, as I said, today we would be focusing on central dogma, genetic code and RNA. So, without wasting any time, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Charu Dobra Rawat. Hello, ma'am. Welcome Thank to you. the Edisit Lecture. Thank you, Geetika. Uh, good afternoon, students. So, today we continue with molecular biology lecture series and today I'll be talking about the central dogma, as already said, genetic code and the RNA. So, before that, I just review the yesterday, uh, the previous lecture, which in which I talked about the structure and function of DNA. So, we came to know about the structure of DNA, that there are two polynucleotide chains which are bound around each other in a double helix. The two chains are running in parallel in direction. In each chain, the nucleotides are joined to each other through 3' prime hydroxyl of the deoxyribose of one nucleotide and the phosphate attached to the 5' prime hydroxyl of another nucleotide and that is why it's a polynucleotide chain by the phosphodiester linkages. The sugar phosphate backbones are on the outside of the helix and the bases are on the inside and they are stacked perpendicularly to the long axis. These bases of the two strands interact together and they form hydrogen bonds. The bases A and T, adenine and thymine matches to form two hydrogen bonds between them and G and C which is guanine and cytosine matches to form three hydrogen bonds between them. The double helical structure of DNA is stabilized by these hydrogen bonding between the bases as well as the stacking energy which is due to the stacking of the bases inside. So that was an overview of the structure of DNA we discussed. We also discussed the function of DNA which is primarily that it is the carrier of genetic information. That is it passes the genetic information from one generation to another. It is the basis, it is the vehicle of heredity. But the questions that arises are that what do we actually mean by this genetic information? We have been talking about that the DNA plays as the vehicle to transfer this information from one generation to another. But what basically is this genetic information? How this genetic information of DNA is conveyed and precisely how the nucleotide language of DNA is translated? So my today's lecture, after uh, going through the lecture, you will basically have the understanding of this flow of genetic information from the DNA to the effector molecules, the proteins. So you will have the understanding of the central dogma, the flow of the gen genetic information. You will be able to describe the characteristics of intermediate molecules which are involved in the flow. So we will look at like what is the, what are the intermediate molecules which are playing a role for this genetic information to go from DNA to the proteins and we will talk about these different types of RNA, the ribosomal RNA, the transfer RNA and the messenger RNA and we will also have the knowledge of the genetic code that is why that is the way the genetic information is processed or translated that how these nucleotides arrangement of the DNA is basically read or translated into the amino acid language of the proteins. So that is the learning objectives of today's lecture. So I start with basically what is genetic information. The genetic information is the instructions a cell needs to sustain itself which basically means that it is the instructions to carry out a cell's regular processes. 
that is the instructions to form molecules needed to carry out these regular processes. So the genetic information is basically the information stored in the cell which is for important for the sustenance of the cell for carrying out all the processes and what the molecules which are formed need to be coded by this information only. The information as we know is stored in the DNA molecule. The DNA molecule information can therefore be processed so that it can form the molecules that is needed out or the instruction can be executed, it can be processed or it can be also transmitted from one generation to another, the prime function of the DNA as we talked about yesterday. So we will look at like how this information is stored in the DNA. The sequence of the nucleotides in the DNA, DNA you know is a polynucleotide chain. So the sequence of the nucleotides in which it is arranged, the DNA must function as a code for the genetic information. So you can look at the arrangement of this polynucleotide chain and because of these varied, varied nucleotides, we can say that the DNA must function as a code for this genetic information. Now you may ask that there are only four nucleotides as we were talking about the A, 4, B, A, G, C and T. So how these four letters can basically have the, in store the uh, such a vast variety of genetic information. But even with only these four letters, there will be virtually infinite number of genetic messages that can exist because the arrangement of these four nucleotides in the DNA sequence is the key for all the information which is stored. So to process this information, we in, it involves the decoding the code into effector molecules that will execute the instructions stored in the code. So the genetic information stored in this nucleotide arrangement needs to be decoded into the molecules which are actually the effector molecules which will instruct the cell how to work and these molecules have to be coded by this genetic information. In a cell, these molecules are proteins. So the DNA has to code for the proteins in a cell. Now if we look at a cell, then we know that the delocalization of DNA and protein differs. The DNA is found mainly in the cell nucleus, whereas the protein synthesis in eukaryotic cells out, occur out in the cell cytoplasm and there has been no evidences that DNA exists in the cytoplasm apart from some of the DNA which is found in the mitochondria or in the chloroplast organelle in plant cells. But apart from that DNA, there is no DNA found in the cytoplasm. So DNA is coding and instructing the formation of proteins, but DNA is itself in the nucleus, whereas the proteins are synthesized in the cytoplasm. So DNA cannot be the direct template for the protein synthesis. The, from the DNA to the proteins, there must be some molecule, some intermediate molecule which is which is uh, causing the DNA to be, uh, for, which is causing the DNA to form the proteins. So when the scientists starting looking at what this intermediate molecule was, RNA was a potential candidate. RNA is ribonucleic acid, it is another kind of a nucleic acid which is present in the cell. And why they thought so was because the RNA nucleic acid is found both in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. So it is localized in a cell in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. The RNA concentration correlates with the protein production. So more the protein, the RNA increases, lesser the protein, the RNA decreases. So the concentration of the RNA correlates with the protein production. Then they also observed that cells that produce large amounts of protein have cytoplasmic dye and radiation absorbing regions indicative of the presence of nucleic acids. Now what does this statement mean? That nucleic acids can absorb the cytoplasmic cell, they can absorb certain dyes and then they can basically absorb certain region of the radiations they, which is characteristic of the nucleic acids. So if you carry out these experiments, you do the staining or you do the uh, spectrophotometry, then the radiations are absorbed or the cytoplasmic dyes are absorbed in the cytoplasm which is correlating with the fact that it, there are some nucleic acids which are present there. And the treatment of the cells with ribonucleases, this is again important because if you treat the cell now with ribonucleases which degrades the RNA, then this capability of the cell to, in, to hold the cytoplasmic dye or to absorb the radiation absorbing regions actually decreases. So that 
clearly told that there is there the RNA is a potential candidate for acting as the intermediate in the uh, DNA transformation into proteins. Then structurally also if you look at it, we discussed about the DNA structure, it is a double helical structure and if you look at the RNA structure then like DNA, RNA also has a sugar phosphate backbone. The difference is that in the sugar that DNA has a deoxyribose sugar whereas the RNA has a ribose sugar. But it is again a polynucleotide chain where the sugar nitrogenous base and the phosphate forms a nucleotide and then multiple nucleotides are linked together by phosphodiester bonds. So the structure is quite similar to DNA. The DNA and RNA probably uses the same nitrogenous bases except then again DNA uses thymine whereas the RNA uses uracil as a nitrogenous base instead of the thymine. The difference is that DNA is double stranded and RNA is typically found in a cell as single stranded but still has the potential for forming complementary helices of the DNA types. In fact, in 1956, the Rich, uh, uh, Professor Rich and his group uh, discovered this for the first time that RNA in natural conditions can also form duplexes. Then in 1960, they also found and published that RNA and DNA can form heteroduplexes. So this was a very great discovery which basically uh, tells that, you know, DNA somehow can transform into, can transcribe into RNA and then RNA can probably be the molecule which can go out of the cell and carry on the protein synthesis. So RNA was a very promising potential candidate because of the features, because of the staining features, the radiation absorbing region features and the structural similarity to the DNA. Discussing about the uh, RNA features, we also, I would just include here that RNA has a primary as well as a secondary structure. Primary structure is inherited, is intrinsic in its sequence. So the sequence basically is the primary structure, but an RNA molecule, since it is single stranded, can also fold to form secondary structures. So owing to the hydrogen bonding between complementary bases on the same strand, the RNA can form different secondary structures. So we will look at down the lane that, you know, RNA specialized molecules, RNA molecules have very specialized secondary structures, which are very important for the uh, part they play in converting DNA to protein. So RNA does exhibit both the kind of primary and a secondary structure. These are the common type of RNAs just because I was talking about RNA so just put it in that the location and function of different classes of RNA molecules you can see. So in, the, uh, in a cell there are three major types of RNA which are present the ribosomal RNA, messenger RNA and transfer RNA and they are found in both prokaryotic as well as eukaryotic cells. Uh, the, Location of ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA is in the cytoplasm whereas the messenger RNA is present both in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm and we will discuss individually about the function of the three molecules. Apart from these there are some other molecules, RNA molecules which are present particularly in the eukaryotic cells in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm are the small nuclear RNA, small nucleolar RNA small cytoplasmic RNA, micro RNA and small interfering RNA and we will discuss when we will talk about the regulatory role that RNA plays. So in molecular biology, regulatory role of RNA is very, very important and these all small RNA molecules play a very important role in that. So we will discuss about these molecules there. In today's lecture, I will touch the messenger RNA, the ribosomal RNA and the transfer RNA. So next is now we know what the genetic information is and we know that from DNA to RNA to proteins this information has to flow. So what is the basis and how this flow of genetic information occur? So a central dogma was proposed based upon the RNA being the potential intermediary molecule and it looks something like that. On, on the left hand side you have a DNA, RNA and protein and all the possible transfers of information as possibilities are given. But on the right hand side, it is only shown whatever is applicable or whatever is there. And this is somewhere in 1958 around when Francis Crick they gave this central dogma. 
He talked about this information flow and also gave a sequence hypothesis. These diagrams of potential information flow were used by Crick to illustrate all possible transfer of information which is on the left hand side and those that are permitted. So the DNA the information can flow to RNA, from RNA the information can flow to protein. The sequence hypothesis refers to the idea that information encoded in the sequence of nucleotides specifies the sequence of the amino acids in the protein. So it's basically the sequence hypothesis states that the arrangement of the nucleotides in the DNA directs the formation of the amino acids and the how the amino acids are linked together and then they form different kind of proteins but execute the functioning of the DNA which, which is encoded by the DNA. So that was again given by Crick and this is the information flow which was shown. So the, info, the central dogma states that once the sequential information has passed into the protein, it cannot get out again. So I would like to emphasize this point here because the DNA goes to RNA and RNA goes to protein, but from protein this information, it cannot be get out, it just remains there. So according to Crit, the central dogma of molecular biology deals with the detailed residue by residue transfer of this sequential information. It states that such information cannot be transferred from protein to either protein or to nucleic acid. This is a more familiar diagram which you must have seen that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein as proposed by the Watson. Just mind that this is the diagram what I am showing is of the uh, what Watson proposed. So the diagram and the central dogma has been modified because you know that RNA can go back to DNA in the form of an enzyme, the, uh, in the activity of an enzyme, the reverse transcriptase, it can convert RNA to DNA. And moreover, there are some, uh, some uh, in some uh, places we can see that the proteins can also be reverted back. But that was the central dogma which was, uh, which was prevalent for many years. The arrow encircling DNA signifies that it is the template for its self-replication. The DNA can duplicate and that is the essence of heredity. That is how it can transmit the genetic information from the parent to the offspring because the DNA can make copies of itself and then that copy can be distributed to the next progeny. So the arrow encircling the DNA signifies that it is the template for its self-replication. The arrow between the DNA and RNA indicates that all cellular RNA molecules are made upon the DNA templates and this process is termed as transcription. Most importantly, both these latter arrows are unidirectional. This is again a statement from Watson, but now we know that RNA can be reverse transcribed into DNA. And then uh, the RNA goes into the protein by a process termed as translation. So you may ask that why are we studying the central dogma when there are so many exceptions which has occurred because still we consider it as a universal and the basis of whatever is developing on it. So this is the basis in every cell that DNA goes to RNA by the process of transcription, RNA goes to protein by the process of translation and DNA can replicate itself also. So that is the foundation of the uh, of the central dogma but still there are things which are coming up. So now we know that DNA goes to RNA and then goes to proteins. So initial belief was that RNA templates were folded up to create cavities on their outer surface for 20 amino acids because now if we look biochemically then how this RNA is going for the formation of the protein or how it is ordering which protein has to come in. So initially they thought that RNA templates were folded up to create cavities on their outer surfaces for different 20 amino acids and the shape of the cavity differs so as to fit only one particular amino acid. So RNA that is the importance that what I told that RNA can form a secondary structure because RNA is a single stranded DNA it can fold upon itself and give rise to secondary structures and can create such cavities and because of their it's different kind of folding it can give, give rise to different kind of cavities and then each cavity corresponds to a particular amino acid. That was the initial belief. But there were many arguments against it. First, the specific chemical groups on four bases of RNA should mostly interact with water soluble groups because there is a hydrophilic in nature. So they must interact with only the water soluble groups. However, the side group chains of amino acids such as leucine, valine and phenylalanine prefer interactions with water insoluble groups. So what about the hydrophobic amino acids, the side chains of amino acids which are hydrophobic in nature? How will they interact with RNA cavities which are primarily hydrophobic? 
hydrophilic in nature. Another argument against it was that RNA template would discriminate between very similar amino acids such as glycine and alanine or valine and isoleucine. Now, formation of a cavity to recognize a particular amino acid, it is not very specific. How will it recognize or how will it discriminate between two very, very closely structurally related amino acids? So, they thought that probably RNA by itself is not uh, responsible for recruiting the amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Again, Crick came, comes into the picture and he proposed what is called as the adapter hypothesis. He stated that prior to incorporation into proteins, the amino acids are first attached to specific adapter molecules which in turn possess unique surfaces that can bind specifically to bases on RNA templates. So, you can see in the figure that there is some kind of a, that green adapter molecule which is, atta which is attaching amino acid to a, its one end and which is also recognizing the, uh, the RNA sequence on the RNA and therefore it is bringing this amino acid towards the polypeptide chain. But that is the proposal, that was the hypothesis and the evidence for this adapter thing came in from the experiments of Zemechnik and Hogland in 1953. They approached the synthesis of the proteins from a biochemical point of view. What they did was they made an extract using rat liver cells. An extract is basically a water based solution containing all plants from the culture of the cell. So, they will extract all the liquid material from the cell and thus it is capable of it contains all the machinery for protein synthesis. So, it can it is it has the potential to synthesize proteins in vitro. So, they made an extract using rat liver cells. So, they took the rat, they made the cell free extract and they added radio labeled amino acids and then incubated it at room temperature and then centrifuged it. So, instead of the because it has all the uh, all the machinery uh, for protein synthesis already present in that extract, the addition of the radio labeled amino acids will ensure that whatever protein synthesis occurs, now it will incorporate these radio labeled or tagged amino acids. And then they incubated it for some time at room temperature for the synthesis to occur and spin it or centrifuged it. After the centrifugation, what they found was there was a supernatant the, which contained the unincorporated amino acids and there was a pellet which contained the newly made polypeptides and it was mingled they found because they size fractionated it, they mingled with it in a large cellular structure which was later identified as ribosomes. So, what they found was or what they observed was that the amino acids were first attached to a low molecular weight RNA in the same soluble fraction. So, when we, they biochemically analyzed the supernatant fraction, they found that some soluble RNA or some RNA molecule was present there. So, some amino acids were attached to these soluble fraction RNA and those amino acids were subsequently transferred to the proteins in the ribosomes. So, in the pellet, the ribosomes were containing the uh, ribosomes were lying. So, these intermediary carrier molecules were named as the soluble RNA which was later identified as the transfer RNA. So, Crick's hypothesis, the adapter hypothesis was substantiated by this experiment that there are certain molecules which act to play a role between the RNA and the protein synthesis. So, they are the ones which recruit the amino acids first and then interact with the ribosome, the cellular structure for the synthesis of the proteins. So, DNA goes to proteins and there is an RNA which is associated with the ribosome. So, now the initial thought was that what RNA, what RNA is it encoding from or what RNA is it reading from? So, the initial thought was that the ribosomal RNA was the template on which the proteins were built because we saw that the DNA is transcribing into an RNA and then RNA is translated into a protein. So, the protein synthesis has to occur on a template of RNA. So, which RNA the initially they thought because ribosome has its own RNA which is the ribosomal RNA so that, that might be acting as the template, but there were arguments against it. The ribosomes are composed of two unequally sized subunits, each containing RNA that either stick together or fall apart in a reversible manner depending upon the surrounding RNA concentrations. So, depending upon the surrounding the environment, the RNA can, the two things can come together, two subunits, so the two subunits can lie separately. 
and both of them contain RNA. So which is playing and they, that is not a constant structure, it is depending upon the RNA concentration. All the ribosomal RNA chains within the small or large subunits were of similar chain lengths. Now, how can they encode for different proteins when they are of the similar lengths? And probably the base composition of both the small and large rRNA chain is approximately the same. So, if the ribosomal RNA which is present in the subunit of the ribosomes are playing as the template, then how can they produce different kind of proteins when they are of a similar length, when they are of a similar base composition. So there must be some other molecule which is acting as the template. And that came from the experiments of Sidney Brenner, Francois Jacob and Matthew Meiselson. In 1960, they performed this experiment and came to know about another intermediary molecule which is playing the role of a template on which the proteins are synthesized. So what they did was they, bacteria, they grew the bacteria in heavy isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. So radioactive isotopes of carbon and nitrogen called as the heavy isotopes, they grew the bacteria in this to label all the bacterial RNA and proteins. So all the bacterial RNA and proteins were now radioactively labeled. Then they infected this bacterial culture with a bacteriophage. Then they immediately transferred the infected bacteria to media that lacked the heavy isotopes but contained the radioactive phosphorus P32. So they, they grew the bacteria for some time in heavy isotopes, carbon uh, and nitrogen and then they infected the, infected the bacterial culture with the phage and immediately transferred it to the, um, to the uh, solution containing radioactive P32. They stopped the phage growth before the bacteria was lysed and they extracted the RNA and ribosomes from it. So they extracted the RNA and ribosomes and then separated the components by density gradient centrifugation. So density gradient centrifugation will ensure the pelleting of the different components based upon their density. So heavier will settle down and the lighter will form the bands over it. They analyzed the distribution and heavy and light isotopes in bacterial ribosomes. So when they analyzed this density gradient centrifugation result, they found there were two bands. One was a heavier band and another was a lighter band. So heavier band consisted of the whole ribosomes, the two subunits together and whereas the lighter band consisted of the dissociated subunits, the single subunits. And when they analyzed for the heavy isotopes that carbon and nitrogen which are present in which of the bands then they found that all the ribosomes were made with the heavy isotope. So they are coming from the bacteria because the bacteria was grown in the heavy isotope. So after phage infection, in, um, infection no, uh, no more uh, components were formed but the ribosomes, the complete ribosomes as well as the individual subunit ribosomes are coming from the original bacteria and that is why they are heavy labeled talking about the Sidney Brenner experiments in which they were analyzing the components. Uh, they grew the bacteria in uh, heavy isotopes and then they analyzed the components. They analyzed and they found that there were density, centri uh, density uh, centrifugation gave two bands and both the bands contain either the whole ribosome or the individual subunit ribosomes and both of them got the heavy isotopes, the carbon and the nitrogen. When they analyzed the incorporation of P32 in the newly made phage RNA, then they found that the P32 was associated with the whole ribosomes and P32 was also at the bottom of the tube. So P32 was only associated with when the two subunits of the ribosomes was coming together. In the upper band, a lighter band which contained only the single subunits of the ribosome, the P32 was not found. So P32 is basically because of the new RNA that is being synthesized and they concluded that some kind of new type of RNA is associated with the ribosomes when they are whole, when the two subunits come together and they must have the role in the protein synthesis. This information carrier was named as the messenger RNA. So now we know that DNA goes to the RNA and there are three types of RNA which plays a role, the messenger RNA, the ribosomal RNA and the transfer RNA and then it is translated into the protein. So before I go further, I will just discuss about certain characteristic features of these types of RNA. So ribosomal RNA is most abundant form and makes up about 80% of the cellular RNA. It is the RNA component of a ribosome. Two thirds of the ribosome are composed of ribosomal RNAs while the remaining one third is made up of proteins. 
Various species of ribosomal RNAs are named based on their sedimentation rates in a centrifuge which is measured in the Swedberg units. Higher the sedimentation coefficient in Swedberg units, the faster is the sedimentation rate. It was first discovered in the 1930s as part of the microsome by Albert Claude and it was characterized as a ribosomal component in the 1950s by George Pallet. The prokaryotes have three varieties of ribosomal RNA termed as 5S, 16S and 23S rRNAs. 5S and 23S rRNAs are found within the larger ribosomal subunit and 16S rRNA is located in the small ribosomal subunit. The eukaryotes have at least four different kinds of ribosomal RNA, the 5S, the 5.8S, 18S and 28S rRNAs. The 5S, 5.8S and 28S rRNAs are found within the large ribosomal subunit whereas the 18S rRNA is located in the smaller subunit or ribosomal subunit. Now the three binding sites for transfer RNAs in the ribosome, when we will detail the protein synthesis, we will see that we know the adapter molecule, the transfer RNA is bringing in the amino acid. So it comes into the ribosome and it has three binding sites which is A, P and E sites and they are formed principally of the ribosomal RNA. So the protein component is outside but the ribosomal RNA form these three sites. Apart from that, the peptidyl transferase center that catalyzes the peptide bond formation between the incoming amino acid and the growing peptide chain is also formed by the ribosomal RNA. The decoding center in the small ribosomal subunit which positions the mRNA and tRNAs is again entirely constructed by ribosomal RNA. So you can well appreciate the role of ribosomal RNA in the protein synthesis. The, uh, the messenger RNA is least abundant RNA, around 5 to 10 percent is present. It shows frequent turnover that it is, it, it has a very short life, very, very short shelf life. It is formed and it is then degraded. The chain length varies with the length of the protein to be coded. So longer the protein, longer will be the mRNA, shorter the protein, shorter will be the mRNA, but that's not a rule. But generally speaking, because there is a procedure in eukaryotes which is called as alternative splicing, so a long RNA can generate generate smaller proteins also. But generally speaking as in prokaryotes, the chain length varies with the length of the protein to be coded. So this is how a typical RNA looks like. The mRNA has a 5 prime untranslated region. Then it has a shine Delgarno sequence which is primarily present in the prokaryotic. Then it has a protein coding region. It has a start codon, it has a stop codon and that has a 3 prime untranslated region. The eukaryotic mRNA is more complex. It has a 5 prime cap site. It has various secondary structures which are present in the untranslated region. It has a CDS which is the coding region and then it might it does the 3 prime untranslated region also has various kind of secondary modifications, secondary structures and then there is a poly A tail. So we will discuss about in the detail about these RNA, the mRNA features when we do the transcription, when DNA goes to RNA and RNA goes to in translation the proteins. So we will talk more about this then. The introns, we talk about that in eukaryotic mRNA, the coding sequences are intervened by or interrupted by the presence of non-coding sequences. The coding sequences are termed as exon and the non-coding sequences are termed as introns. And these introns in the final proteins are basically replaced and this is done by, so the initial mRNA is an immature mRNA, it is called as an HNRNA. And then after a procedure called as splicing, these introns are removed and exons are joined together which will code for the protein. So the non-coding sequences or introns are removed during RNA splicing to produce a mature mRNA transcript which is composed of exon. So this is just an example because RNA splicing form a full uh, detailed uh, a lecture on itself which we will do down the lane. But this is the uh, just an example to show that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 exons present in this stretch of DNA and when the introns are removed they can transcribe to give two types of RNA and this is called as alternative splicing. So they can give rise to an OVA albumin gene or they can give rise to a cytochrome B gene as it is shown. So this is again important uh, characteristic for the mRNA to be there. Now the next question is that how the nucleotide language of mRNA is translated into amino acid language of proteins. So what is this genetic code? 
the information stored in the DNA, the arrangement of nucleotides when it is transcribed into mRNA, then how it is read, how it is read from the mRNA to synthesize that what order of proteins have to come in. So, if one nucleotide there were 4 possible amino acids could be there, then in 2 nucleotides were there, there is 4 into 4 possible codons and if it reads 3 nucleotides, then there is a possibility of 64 codons for 20 amino acids. So, at least 3 nucleotide must code for a protein that is why it can be the 20 amino acids can be coded by the proteins. The distinct possibilities can be that this code can be overlapping or non-overlapping that which is shown that it can read from say uh, 1 as a whole the 3 triploid then 1, 2 and 3 or 1, 2 and 3 on the left hand side of the uh, slide you can see that and one on the top of it the 1, 2 and 3 is basically the overlapping code and moreover the code the code can also have commas or not. So, they were to elucidate that they are reading now the reading of the, of the DNA how does it occur. The uh, experiment Akira, Sugita and Heinz Frankel Conrad in 1960, what they did was they proposed that a mutation or a change in one nucleotide would cause changes in more than one amino acid in the resulting protein. So, if the code was overlapping, if you do a mutation or a change in one of the nucleotides, then it would cause change in more than one of the amino acids in the resulting protein. They used tobacco mosaic virus and they treated its DNA with uh, nitrous acid and leading to a point mutation in the DNA sequence and then they compared the protein produced by the mutated DNA with that produced by a normal viral DNA. The amino acid sequence of the mutant protein contained a change only in one amino acid. So, basically that these are the initial things which are going on that they, how they are going to decipher the genetic code, how they are understanding the fact that how it is read from the mRNA and translated into a protein. So, this uh, Sugita and Conrad experiment revealed that it is a non-overlapping uh, code because if one mutation is made in the DNA then it is affecting probably only one amino acid. Acid. Then 1961 Francis Crick, Barnett, Brenner and Watts Tobin performed the experiments using the T4 bacteriophage and they made use of what is called as the frame shift mutations. Now frame shift mutations is caused by either the addition or deletion of a base in the original DNA sequence which in turn causes the protein forming machinery to shift positions or reading frames on the RNA. So, as it is shown it is a consequent it is a concurrent sequence of ABC, ABC, ABC. So, if a particular base for example, there is a deletion which is occurring of A then the reading frame is entirely changed or if the addition is there then also the reading frame is changed. If a simultaneous addition and simultaneous deletion will restore. So, that was the hypothesis on which they were performing. So, frame shift alters the codon groupings and thus the corresponding protein is made with incorrect amino acids from the point of the mutation onward. The mutation introduced into a viral protein involved in the infection of the E. coli bacteria and what their observations were that a single frame shift, frame shift mutation rendered the protein ineffective. The two additions rendered the protein ineffective again. But first they added a base and later they suppressed the mutation that deleted a base put the code back on the track. So, the amino acids could differ but they put the code back on the track that if they added a nucleotide or if they removed a nucleotide. Then introduction of three separate frame shift mutations each added a base to the same DNA able put the code back on the track three mutations that deleted a base could also rescue protein function and infectivity. So, if the bases were moved in the groups of three, then they were removed well or addition will probably rescue the protein function and infectivity. So, this clearly supported the existence of a triplet code or at least a code written in the multiples of three bases. So, now we know that the code is a is a non-overlapping code, the code is a comma-less code, the code is basically a triplet code which is there. Now, which particular triplet code is giving is basically incorporating which amino acid? So, which specific groups of three bases code for which amino acid was the next question to ask? And this was done by the Marshall Nirelberg and Johann Methai in 1961. They extracted the cell free extract and added DNAs. DNAs will remove all the DNA which is present 
and then they added a synthetic mRNA. So there is no more DNA present in the tube. The only mRNA which is there is now the synthetic mRNA which they have included. The synthetic mRNA was formed by the action of an enzyme called as polynucleotide transferase which joins together the different bases. So as you can see it is a stretch of U, 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 U uh, amino acids which is there. So they added the synthetic mRNA to the cell free extract and then they have, uh, added the radio labeled amino acids to it and then they centrifuged it. The observation was that a sequence of three uracil codes for the amino acid phenyl aniline because when they analyzed the sediment, biochemically analyzed the sediment, it contained only the phenyl alanine amino acid. So because they have added a mRNA which has a series of U, 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 U arranged, so basically a triplet code of U, U and you know the, trip, the code is triplet, so U, U, U is coding for phenyl alanine. So they performed similar experiments with other synthetic RNAs such mRNA such as CCCC in order or AAA in order and started finding out that which triplet code is giving rise to the which amino acid like poly C codes for the amino acid proline and poly A codes for the amino acid lysine. So that is how they did it, it is the sum of the experiment that by the action of polynucleotide phosphorylase they created the synthetic mRNAs and when these synthetic mRNAs are introduced then artificial mRNA is introduced into the tubes then only one of the amino acids is formed because a triplet code of for example UUU gave rise to phenylalanine, AAA gave rise to lysine and CCC gave rise to proline. But now what about the hetero triplet codes which are not together. So that came from in 1965 from Hargovind Khurana. He employed chemically synthesized RNA molecules of known repeating sequences rather than random sequences. He translation of the artificial GU, GU mRNA yielded a protein of alternating cysteine and valine residues. Although he could not determine that whether the GUG is encoding cysteine or UGU is encoding cysteine, but still he made a hetero uh, encoding things and it could code for the different amino acids. So this kind of a genetic code came into a picture. For example, like 50 triplet codons were assigned the amino acids which they code for. Then Marshall Nirenberg and Phil Leder to Phil know more about this thing then use the activation of transfer RNA as another tool to identify the amino acids which were coded by the certain triplet codes. They use the tRNA, now we will talk about certain features of tRNA, they serve as you know the molecular adapters that bind to messenger RNA on one end and carry amino acids into position on the other. The 30 to 40 different tRNAs are present with more than one tRNA corresponding to each amino acid. tRNA is a single stranded molecule with typically about 75 nucleotides. In 1962, Robert Holley solved the structure of tRNA and all tRNAs possess a common secondary structure, the clover leaf like structure in a L shaped configuration as shown in the picture. A loop at one end of the folded structure base pairs with three nucleotides on the mRNA that are collectively called as a codon. So we already know that the triplet codon and one of the triplet codon is called as a code is called as a codon. The complementary three nucleotides on the tRNA is called as the anticodon. The opposite end of the folded structure which is the 3 prime end of the tRNA binds to its corresponding amino acid at an attachment site that is also 3 nucleotides long invariably CCA. So tRNA also has a D loop, a T5C loop or a variable loop with usually 4 to 5 nucleotides but up to 20 base pairs. The features above presumably relate to binding to a protein. So the characteristic feature is that on one of the end it has a anticodon which, co which correlates with the mRNA and on one of the end it has a uh, amino acid binding site. So when the, uh, the pairing between the codon and the anticodon takes place over three nucleotides and complementarity basic pairing is only necessary between the first two nucleotides. So I introduce this wobble position also here since I am talking about the characteristics of the tRNA that, that it is not necessary that all the three nucleotides should be strictly complementary to the mRNA which is there. The third position is usually referred to as the wobble position and as you can see that the codon are UCC and UCU and both the codons are recognized by the same tRNA carrying the serine amino acid which has AGG is at its anticodon. So the first two amino acids, uh, first two uh, nucleotides AG has to be uh, 
uh, the same but the third position the g can be variable because in codon one at one place it is c and the other place it can be u so this agg anti codon can code with the ucc as well as the ucu and this is called as the wobble hypothesis enzymes called as amino acyl trna synthetases attach the correct amino acid to each trna so trna is not always carrying the amino acid but the enzymes such as amino acyl trna synthetases attaches the amino acid to the trna based on the three dimensional structure of the trna molecule and the trna attached with its um, cognate amino acid is termed as to be activated. Now, Nirenberg and Methai actually use this, Nirenberg and Phil Leder actually used this activated tRNA property to find out more or to decipher more of the genetic code. They synthesized short mRNA, three or six nucleotides with known sequences. They added the mRNAs one by one to a mix of ribosomes and activated amino acyl tRNAs and they passed it through the filter. The ribosomes bound to the mRNA and tRNA was retained while the unbound ribosomes or mRNA or tRNA passed through and then they identified the amino acid. So they knew the sequences, they knew the activated amino acid. Now whatever amino acid goes and binds to the mRNA they would identify that okay that code codes for this particular amino acid so that was again their uh, their approach and so this genetic table genetic code table was constructed in which AUG as you can see in the green uh, it's code is specifically codes for methionine which is the start codon and UAA UAG and UGA the amber apple and ochre also called as basically code for the stop codons in the uh, genetic code table. Genetic codes refers to the relationship between sequence of nucleotides on mRNA and the sequence of amino acid in the protein. So I quickly review the salient features of the genetic code. So the codons are triplet codons. There are 64 possible codons because 4 into 4 into 4 possibilities of which 61 code for the 20 different amino acids and 3 code for the stop codons and 1 uh, function as the a start codon. So, each codon codes for only one particular amino acid and so the genetic code is said to be unambiguous and specific. Since some amino acids are coded by more than one codon, the genetic code is referred to as degenerate. The codons are read in a contiguous manner without any punctuation, so it is a comma-less codon. The genetic code is universal that is the codon code for the same amino acid in any organism be it a bacterium or a human being. AUG has dual functions of coding as I stated it acts as an initiator codon when present at the starting of the gene but when it is located inside the gene that it serves for the, uh, amino, the amino acid methionine in between. Now the deciphering of the genetic code by three scientists basically gave them the Nobel Prize, the Holly, Gobind Khurana and Nirenberg got the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1968 for their interpretation of the genetic code and its function into the protein synthesis. So that I end my lecture today based upon this. So we talked about the uh, genetic code and the central dogma and we will proceed uh, by talking about the uh, role of DNA in transmitting the genetic information that is DNA replication which will be taken in the next lecture. Thank you. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us a very productive session. I hope that all the students who might have watched us or would be watching us would be benefited from this particular lecture. So on the part of the students, on the behalf of the students, I feel that uh, I should ask certain questions uh, so that it becomes convenient for them to understand the topic uh, more easily. That is uh, to understand our uh, series on molecular biology very easily. So ma'am, uh, now the question arises as you explained about the RNA and DNA in the two separate sessions and we have a deep analysis on uh, the two the two terms and uh, the, what we have found that this seems to be uh, seems to be uh, similar but still there are different so why there are such differences between the RNA and DNA see the primarily the difference between DNA and RNA is that in one the deoxyribose sugar is present and in another the ribose sugar is present and the second one is that in DNA the thymine nitrogenous base is there whereas in RNA it is replaced by uracil so as far as the ribose sugar is concerned uh, uh, it is thought that the presence of the hydroxyl group at the 2 prime position 
and the RNA makes it a little unstable because this oxygen which is present tends to in be involved in lot of reactions. In fact, the action of some enzymes uh, such as RNAs is they primarily act on this hydroxyl group present at the 2 prime position. So, RNA is transient, it is formed and it is degraded quickly, but DNA has to be very, very stable. The first thing in the requirement of a genetic material to be consistently transmitted from one generation to another. So, probably we can think of that the replacement of this hydroxyl group by a hydrogen, just, just a hydrogen remain in the deoxyribose sugar is basically because of that. And as far as the replacement of nitrogenous base uracil is concerned in the DNA, the thymine is present. Then if you look at the structure of thymine and uracil, there is only an addition of the methyl group. And this group is basically, uh, if, we, if we look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the changes that can occur, then the cytosine and other nitrogenous base which is present in DNA can spontaneously deaminate to form uracil. And it is a very frequent, uh, it is a slow process, but it is a very frequent process. So, the error can occur and cytosine can by itself deaminate to form uracil. So, if a repair machinery and the repair machinery generally goes and correct it in the DNA. So, but if the thymine was replaced by uracil in the DNA, then how will the repair machinery identify that it is the uracil which is supposed to be there or it is being produced due to the deamination of the cytosine. So, uh, probably over the evolutionary thing, the thymine was restored and uracil was replaced because of this. And in RNA, such a thing is not because it is a transient structure, such a replacement will not affect much. So, it was retained over the evolution in RNA. So, probably these two differences are based upon these things. And I hope, hope that all the students who might have uh, heard about the differences, uh, what uh, Dr. Charu Dogra explained uh, would be clear now as uh, we always say that apart from books, these lectures are audio visual aid for you so that it becomes convenient for you to understand the topics in detail. Uh, now the question arises as you explained yourself about the central dogma. Uh, is central dogma truth? What would we say? Uh, see, what I talked about in today's lecture because I was doing it from a historical perspective. So, I discussed only the two versions of central dogma that was proposed by uh, Crick and that was proposed by Watson, the two uh, scientists, the two molecular biologists who gave the structure of DNA, uh, the model structure of DNA. Uh, the central dogma, I would say that, you know, there are, th that is the truth basically as of we know. Because initially when they started with it, they did not even know about the reverse transcriptase. So, they were, they said that it is, it, the, from RNA it cannot go back to DNA. Or once the information is out from DNA, it cannot come back. But now we know that RNA can be transcribed into DNA. And in some cases probably, I thought that Crick version was a little better one. Because he said that from protein the information cannot go out. But now we know that there are some aspects where the protein can probably go and go back to the uh, initial molecules. So, central dogma is truth, it is called as dogma because that is the, as I said, it is the foundation, it is the base, it is the things how we link together DNA, RNA and proteins. But of course, there are much more uh, changes or modifications which can come up. Definitely. Uh, we understood about the central dogma as what you explained. Now, again the question arises, what about uh, genetic code? Uh, are genetic codes uh, universal? A genetic code is universal as of we say about the nuclear DNA because in bacteria, in human beings or from anywhere if you isolate the genetic, uh, uh, isolate the DNA, the code is same and that is why we said universal. But of course, the DNA is present in mitochondria and in fact, the mitochondrial DNA does not follow this genetic code. There are certain features which are distinct. And uh, probably in one of the lectures, I will touch the organal DNA in which I talk in detail about the mitochondrial and the chloroplast DNA. And then we can see that the nuclear DNA is probably universal, but between the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA also the genetic code differs at some points. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. But as we have uh, some few minutes left with us, uh, so I would like to have a glossary for the students. So, can we have a uh, one-liner definitions of all uh, the terms we used in the two lectures that is today and a day before yesterday? Uh, that is yesterday. Uh, one is DNA, RNA, genetic code. So, can we have a one-liner definition so that uh, students um, uh, who might found it difficult to understand the whole concept uh, would be getting it through those one-liner definitions? Sure. Uh, 
we, I start with the DNA. The DNA is a deoxyribonucleic acid and it is the uh, it is the carrier for the genetic information by which it is the storage of the information is there. RNA is the ribonucleic acid uh, and it is the intermediary molecule which plays a role for the DNA to be converted into proteins. Genetic code as I said is the uh, it's the it's the it's the it's the language which the for by which the DNA is translated into the protein. So the codon, the triplet codon, how which it is trans, uh, transferred. Uh, the central dogma is the universal acceptance in the flow of genetic information from DNA to RNA to protein. What we consider uh, RNA, we can talk about three types of RNA: the messenger RNA, which acts as the template for the protein synthesis; transfer RNA, which brings in the amino acids to the uh, to the grow for the growing polypeptide chain and ribosomal RNA which forms the important constituents where the protein synthesis takes place and it is a part of the uh, ribosomes. And so, uh, very successfully we have uh, carried two lectures in the series on molecular biology. So, what else are our students going to study in the future sessions? In the future session as I said the next, next lecture will talk about the DNA duplication because the DNA the primarily the DNA act as the uh, carrier of the genetic information. So, it transmits the information from one uh, from the parent to the offspring and that the duplication the DNA duplication is the or the replication as it is called as the essence of it. So, the next lecture will cover the DNA replication and then uh, we will follow the central dogma, we will talk about the DNA transcription into RNA, we will talk about the protein synthesis that how RNA you know the basic mechanism or the detailed mechanism how it is formed. Uh, before that I will also talk about the genome organization as I was talking about yesterday this is a double helical structure of DNA that is the basis of uh, you know how the DNA is but how it is present in the cell what are the higher order structures how it is found as a chromosomes. So, we will talk about the genome organization we will also talk about the genome organization in different organisms in bacteria in viruses or in uh, eukaryotic system and, uh, and uh, more on eukaryotic system that how this uh, genome is also organized. So, we will touch upon all these aspects, the molecular aspects of how the cell is working. Definitely with this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving your precious time as well as precious inputs to this uh, very lecture. Students, if you have any queries, then you can mail us at info.cc at the rate and ic.in. We would love to solve your queries the next time when Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat visits our studio. And if you want to access this lecture once again or the number of times you want it, dear friends, very soon we are going to upload this lecture on YouTube so that it becomes convenient for you to study or to get the in-depth knowledge on uh, the molecular biology. We would be meeting again. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so Thank very you. much. Thanks.